back in the corner here, keep me behind the podium. Uh, so this got put together uh, from uh, having a conversation with Tony. As the uh, I, president for the ISC2 Central Florida chapter, it's gone through a rebranding. And uh, now they're no longer ISC squared, they're called ISC2. Anyway, uh, with the chapter, one of the things we did last year was we did a workshop or a training session on the CC certificate, the uh, Certified in Cybersecurity certification from ISC2. Uh, and we did the whole thing. It took all day. It was an eight-hour thing as we went through all the different domains and, and explained it and uh, essentially kind of taught the, the, the students that were there or attendees that were there about the certification, what you need to know for that. And so talking with Tony, it was, well, hey, we could do something similar. I'm not going to do an eight-hour day. Uh, I said, we can probably squish it all. I can go through highlights and do it all in about two hours. So that's kind of where this start came from. Uh, and uh, so what I'm going to do is talk about the certification, uh, what's involved, kind of breakdown of what material you've got to know. And then I'm going to go into the, the five different domains and cover the highlights with regards to the cert what it takes, what you need to know for the certification. Before I get going, who in here already has a certification? Okay, so cool. Are, are they, you have an, so let me rephrase the question. Who in here already has an ISC2 certification? Two folks, okay. So everybody in here wants, is looking to get a certification or considering the ISC2 CC certification? For the most part, yeah. Okay, I'm seeing some head nods, thank you very much. Okay, good. Uh, so. And that's good, because that will at least allow me to give me an idea of, of how we're going to go through and, and talk about this today. Um, how many people in here are students? Cool. All right. University or high school? High school? University? Cool. All right. So a good mix. Um, how many people are doing cybersecurity as a second career and looking to get a cert? Okay. Kind of there? Okay. All right. Um, so I forgot, to, I failed to mention this morning, but uh, if you're interested, I have free Kevin stickers and I have security mastermind stickers up here you're welcome to come and get. Um, and this, with the high school and the college students, does anybody know what the free Kevin sticker means? Yeah. Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick. Anybody know the name Kevin Mitnick besides you? No? Yeah? Okay. So for the rest of you, you don't know who Kevin Mitnick is. All right. Let me tell you a story first before we, I dive into this. Kevin Mintnick, he wrote a book called Ghost in the Wires, and it was about his, we're going to call them adventures, that he had in the 90s. And he started out as a phone freaker. A phone freaker wasn't somebody doing something with their iPhones. No, this was somebody doing something with rotary dial phones. Um, if you, you may want to, you might have to Google that if you're not sure what that is. Uh, but he did a lot of phone freaking with the tones uh, of a phone and started out with a Captain Crunch Bailman's whistle that they could blow into the whistle and create the tones on the phone to be able to make long distance phone calls. I mean, they were hacking phones back when it was the old rotaries uh, and the tip and switch. Um, well, Kevin got involved in the computers and he got into having a modem and getting involved. Back then it was BBS, bulletin boards. So think Reddit, just but all text. Uh, and he got into, he was very good at social engineering. He was very good at convincing people to do something that they may not otherwise do. And for Kevin, a lot of it was all about what could he get, a, what could he get away with? What could he do? And he hacked into MasterCard and stole a whole slew of credit cards. He hacked into, oh, on the names, he hacked into several companies and, and was able to get software. There was like a new operating system coming out for one of the computers. And he hacked into them and was able to get their software. Well, they eventually caught the eye of the FBI and other government entities, and so they were chasing him, and he was bouncing all around the country. Um, anyway, he unfortunately, well, fortunately, I think fortunately, was arrested, uh, but the kicker was when he was put in front of the judge for his trial, the prosecution basically said if we put Kevin in jail, he has to be in solitary confinement because he cannot be allowed anywhere near a phone because he has, he has the ability where if he could call up NORAD, he could whistle in the launch codes and fire off all the nuclear weapons. And the judge believed it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Anyway, so Kevin ends up, Kevin Mintner goes to jail, 
for a lot for five years, I think is what it was, a lot, a lot longer than he really should have. They basically threw the book at him. There was a huge movement that got started up called Free Kevin. And stickers were made, T-shirts were made, and everything else. Matt Perry, one of the organizers of the conference, had one of the original Free Kevin stickers from the 90s. So um, fast forward five years, Kevin serves his time, gets out of jail. He's on a five-year probationary period, not allowed to touch a computer. And on the uh, day one of, of year five after that probation, he's on a computer talk show called um, Tech TV. And Leo Laporte is there with him. And... Um, Steve, uh, yeah, Steve Wozniowski is there as well, and basically give him a, a new MacBook, MacBook computer at that point. It was the clamshell one. And um, at that point, Kevin decides to start his own security consulting company and goes on to make millions. Uh, Kevin Mitnick also becomes the chief hacking officer for Nobefore, where I work. Back in 2013, the, the uh, CEO offered him half the company so we could use the Kevin Mitnick name and likeness because all the IT people knew who Kevin was. Uh, the reason that we have the free Kevin stickers and on the, um, I don't have one handy, but the, the sticker pack that came out that you guys have, it says Kevin is free. Uh, unfortunately, Kevin was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer last year, and he passed away at the age of 59, four days before his 60th birthday um, in July. Uh, so now we have all of our free Kevin stickers and the Kevin is free. That's, that was actually Matt's contribution to it. Um, but Kevin Mitnick was basically one of the pioneers for us in cybersecurity, social engineering, and everything else. And so, um, so I have the free Kevin stickers. So sorry, didn't mean to go on about with that story. But uh, he was quite the uh, interesting fellow, to say the least, which was good because it gave every time for everybody else to show up. All right. So the CC. Now, I know that as a college professor, I talk to a lot of my students. And you have the CompTIA certifications, right? You have your A+. Plus, you have your Security Plus, the Network Plus, you've got uh, Amazon certs, you've got Microsoft certs that you can get. So there's a lot of different certs that are out there uh, when you're first starting out. I know for me, I got my A Plus certification way, way, way back in 1998, I think is when it was. And I think I'm grandfathered in now. I never have to do any more CPEs for them or uh, pay the yearly rate. The, the CC was created uh, last year as a way for people that are getting into cybersecurity to show that they know the, the concepts, the entry-level concepts of cybersecurity. And there are five domains that are associated with it, and we're going to go and we're going to break those down. But basically, the CC was created for people coming into the industry, either at a college or a second career, you know, or post-military. Um, it's interesting, if you talk to cyber people that are in the industry that have been in here 10, 15, 20 years, maybe even five years, everybody's origin story is all a little different. It, nobody really has the same origin story. Some people come from IT, some people came out of insurance, some people came out of theater, some people came out of you know marketing, whatever it may be. Uh, but we all have our own different origin stories. But the CC is there to allow people to be able to show that they've got a particular level of skill sets and competence when it comes to cybersecurity. Now, if you're familiar with ISC2 and you know of the CISSP, which is the Certified Information System Security Professional CERT. The requirements for that one is you need five years of experience. Then you pass the test. And so for a lot of people trying to break into the industry, how can I get a certification to show I know cybersecurity if I can't get a job to give me five years of experience? So it's kind of a vicious cycle. So that's why the CC was created, the Certified in Cybersecurity. So again, if it, you're a lot of the candidates that uh, that have been coming through already. Some of them are IT professionals, got a year or two of experience, want to have a cert. Uh, could be career people coming in on a second career, like I said, students. Or I've seen lawyers and executives look at getting the certification as well. And what ISC2 is doing is right now, if you want to get a certification from CompTIA or Microsoft or one of them, you've got to pay a set rate to take the exam, whether it's 50 bucks, 500 bucks, whatever it may be. Right now with ISC2, what they're doing is they want to bring a million people into the industry. And what they're doing is they're giving away the CC. I won't say they're giving it away, but they are covering the cost of the CC for you as candidates. And what you do is you sign up to the ISC2 website, uh, isc2.org. You create an account, 
And then what you do is you become a candidate. And you, you will then get a voucher to take the exam. The exam, I think, is about $250, or $150, sorry. So they're going to waive the test fee for you, so that way you can take it. So the ISC2 is very interested in getting more people into the industry. And within ISC2, once you become a part of it, then we have certifications for cloud. There's the CCSP for cloud security professionals. And then we also have it for system administrators, so the SSCP. So if you're working as a system, sysadmin in IT, and you've got a security mindset, and you want to show that you've got an understanding, then essentially you have that, you have that option. So there's, there's three certs that you can get before you need to take the CISSP. There's no, you don't have to have those three to take the CISSP, but it's a good way for folks to kind of build up their certifications that they have. And then also you're part of the ISC2 family, essentially, is, is what it's working towards. So no experience is needed to take the CC. You just have to sign up study for the exam and pass the exam and then submit a resume. You basically submit your resume so they've got that on file uh, and then you're accredited and then you get the, you're known as the CC. So okay, great, you get a certified in cybersecurity certification, what kind of jobs can you do? And I know, I mean, that's a whole other workshop in it, to it itself of the job market. And I recognize and I know that it's not easy. I just did a, uh, a presentation at at Wild West Hacking Fest with a buddy of mine where we talked about how do you level up your skill set? How do you level up you as a person in this industry when we have so many people coming in, so many jobs are available, but people aren't you know, getting hired as quickly as they'd like to be. But the CC uh, job roles, looking at security analyst, specialists, you know, working in a SOC, could be an auditor role, maybe forensics, uh, junior pen testers, you know, that's always, I know that's where a lot of folks are interested in. Security engineer, uh, maybe a security manager or a sysadmin. So some of the benefits, if you obtain the certification, you know, hopefully job offers and advancement. That's, I know for me, when I got my CISSP, that kind of opened up a lot of doors. <laughs> that was also 15 years ago. Uh, there, you know, opportunity to be able to connect with other professionals. You, you don't need to have a certification, but you can always join an ISC2 chapter or an ISSA chapter, that those are available. Uh, and hopefully it does provide some sort of pathway for you as you work towards uh, your career overall. In the exam itself, like I said, it's broken up into five different domains that they're covering. So we have uh, business continuity, that's about 10% of the exam. You got 18% dealing with security operations. So it's taking the security concepts and being able to apply it in working like a security operations center or a SOC. Then you've got access controls, because security is all based around confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And to be able to handle that confidentiality of access controls, security principles, and then network security. And network security is about a quarter of it, along with security principles being the other quarter of it. Quarter of it. And then being able to go through, and then what you're doing, the, the percentages, uh, there's Oh, here it is. There's like 100 questions that you have in the exam, and it's an adaptive exam, so if you've ever taken one of those, once you hit 100 questions, if you've, you're not meeting any of the particular areas and they're looking for you to strengthen it, then you're going to probably get additional questions from that particular domain that you need to work on. So it, it's an adaptive exam. I think the most you can get up to, is, it doesn't say, but 125, I think, is kind of the max where it goes to. But once you hit that 100 mark, if you, know, you go 101, 102, 103, and then it says, congrats, you're done, then you know, probably a good chance that, that you've uh, been able to pass it. It's in a variety of different languages. Uh, you get two hours to take the exam, and then it says you need to score a 700 out of 1,000. So 70%, which I think is kind of funny, because if you're in college or high school, 70%, I think, is like a C right? You know, for a grade. So all you need is a C, and you get to be a cybersecurity professional. Um, but then again, I know security professionals out there that don't have certs and are like top of the field. And then I know people that have certs and shouldn't be in the field altogether anyway. But that, that's a different story. Um, as, I go, as I go through this, uh, if you've got questions, ask away. Uh, this is, I want this to kind of, I can sit here and I can lecture for two hours. That's easy. But if you've got questions and things you want to know as we go along, ask away. Um, what I'm going to do now is kind of go through the different domains and talk about the different areas. Talk about what you need to study for for the certification. 
what uh, you have available, if when you sign up with IAC2, they give you a study guide and they give you training materials. And one of the things that I got early on, I got my hands on early on, were training videos, the self-paced training videos that you can sit and watch. And uh, I had teased Tony. I said, sure, I can do four hours. I'll just, I'll just play all six videos. That'll be great. Be great. Be easy. Uh, but no, what I'm going to do is, is kind of go through and, like I said, hit the highlights, what you want to focus on with regards to the different domains, and then give some exam tips at the end. So if you've got questions as we go, just raise your hand and ask away. One of the things when it comes to ISC2, now I know this, is an, this deck was created before the, the branding, but the information still applies. But when you get a certification from ISC2, you agree to a code of ethics. And what we do in our industry, we learn how the bad guys work. We learn how to do the, the pen testing, how to attack an organization, uh, and so forth. So there is a code of ethics that we have to follow as ISC2 members. And essentially, it's regarding you know, being honorable, protecting the, the society, um, you know, looking at the one line that I always pull back to always is looking at uh, acting honorably, honestly, justly, responsibly, and legally. That's the key word there, legally. Um, and so a lot of it, you know, that's, you know, if you're going to be pen testing an organization, make sure you've got permission, you know, those kind of things. You're not attacking websites to say, ooh, let me see if I can break into the particular web X website. Um, not the website for X, just in general a website. And also looking to advance and, and uh, improve, protect the, the profession and everything that we do overall. Okay, so looking at Security principles, so this is the first domain. This is kind of baselining everybody with regards to security. And we always talk about confidentiality and integrity, the CIA triad. And it's gonna be different for whichever industry you might be in. You know, if you're working in a law firm, integrity is gonna be one of the key things for them. Confidentiality right behind it, and then availability. Whereas you have something like a power plant or an energy company, for them, availability is the key because we gotta have electricity. And if they end up having to shut a power plant down because they gotta do Microsoft Patch Tuesday, that becomes a problem. So different organizations are gonna look at the CIA triad differently. So it's, it's important that you understand what the, each of the different terms mean and being able to explain them. We look at authentication. So when we're, you know, confidentiality, looking at being able to protect data whether that's through encryption or access controls, and with access controls comes authentication. You're gonna identify who you are, but then you need to authenticate to show that that's who you really are. This looks at risks, threats, vulnerabilities, understanding what all three of them are and how, three are them, how th each of them are different, um, and looking at it based on the organization. Looking at controls, how do you, what controls you put into place to protect an asset, whether that's a server, and a user account, active directory, whatever that firewall, router, switch, whatever that may be. And then you're gonna have different control groups. You're gonna have physical, administrative, and then logical, and how those support each of those different assets. Uh, governance, pretty well anything. One of the, uh, a good friend of mine, he is basically Mr. Governance Risk and Compliance, GRC. Uh, and if you're somebody that is of like a, a technical mind, but you are very good at you know creating procedures or, or wanting to be precise with procedures or you like to write, GRC is a great field to, be, uh, to go into as well. Um, so looking at the CI triad, I talked about you know, confidentiality, integrity, availability, understanding what those different terms are. And again, those three are gonna cover both your um, physical and logical distance. I've always said anything that can happen in the real world can happen in cyberspace and vice versa. You know, you get a cold, well, that's a virus, right, in, in the computer space. We have, you know, door, we have locks on doors, that's kind of like the firewall or access controls. So understanding what those three different things are and, and then how they apply. When we look at talking about authentication, we talk about multi-factor authentication. You know, something you have, something you know, um, and then something you are. And, and one of the great things we're seeing that, you know, with Apple and Android devices on our, on our phones, we're, ironically, we're still only doing one form of authentication. Uh, you know, you're either using a thumbprint or your face, if you've got the, the iPhones. They're not asking you to enter in a code and then authenticate off your face. Additionally, it all works basically just off of, you know, the one of them. But 
when you log into your bank on your computer or you're logging into social media, you have multi-factor uh, multi controls in place, something you have, um, either your phone or a code or an authenticator app, or it, and then it's something you know, like a username and a password. And your username essentially is your identification, and the password is the authentication. So it's important to make sure you're understanding the different components and, and how they work overall. You know, multi-factor versus single-factor, whoops. Um, you know, when you're doing single-factor authentication, that's either just your username and a password, or it's just your face or a fingerprint. Uh, and it's important to make sure you understand the differences between the two and being able to um, apply that based on different uh, scenarios. Uh, so consider a lot of the time when it comes to your um, authentication, it's going to depend on your organization. It's going to depend on what you have going on. What is it you're protecting? You know, if you're going to spend, you know, hundred thousand dollars to protect, you know, a, an external facing system or a system that may not be as critical, um, it's important to understand where you know you're spending the money and is it more valuable than if it's if you're spending ten thousand dollars for a, a five thousand dollar protecting a five thousand dollar system. Um, depending on what the loss of that data could be will depend on what consideration you have for what solution you're going to put into place. Non-repudiation, this is always a fun topic. Uh, I've had many conversations over the years when it came to uh, turning to organizations when they wanted to be able to, for us to be able to prove that we knew who was logging in. And so with non-repudiation, that is basically not being able to deny that the person did or didn't do something. So it's undeniable proof that yes, when we have it in the log that that person logged in, we have that non-repudiation. And so understanding that when the difference between both of those terms is important. We look at risk, and risk is a major part of cybersecurity. It's a part of any type of security if you think about it. We're always reducing risk. And whether, if you think about your home um, where you're looking at, you know, you've got an alarm system on your house, or you might have motion sensor uh, lights or cameras. You're doing that because you want to reduce the risk of somebody trying to break into your home. When you've got um, those all working, and if someone does try to break in, it's not going to protect, it's not going to stop the person or prevent the person from actually breaking into the home because they could still break in. They could smash the window, the alarm would sound, they could still get into the house. It's a matter of deterrent. It's a matter of reducing that risk. If somebody, if a, a, a burglar is going to walk up to a house and see cameras and lights um, and a security sign out front, and then he goes to another house and they don't have any of that, well, then that's an easy target for the burglar. They're going to go to the house that doesn't have all the other security on. So it's all about reducing risk when it comes to uh, it overall. And so in cybersecurity, we're doing the same things. We're protecting assets, you know, whether it's um, we're looking at you know, servers, we're looking at data, we're, all, we're protecting those. And so we're looking at trying to reduce that risk overall, the possibility of something bad happening. And, you, and then from there, you're, and when it comes to uh, going through risk, it can be a very dry subject. Uh, but it is an important aspect overall when it comes to cybersecurity for us, because you're looking at the risk, the possibility of something happening, the threat, which is something that can do the harm, and then you have that vulnerability, which is basically that weakness. So um, if you think about your homes, you know, a vulnerability could be you've got a broken latch on a, on a window in the back. Uh, that threat is going to be somebody gaining access into your house, uh, but the possibility of that happening, they have to know that the latch doesn't work. So for them, they'd have to go around and try all the windows in the house. It's kind of like when you are doing a pen test, you're scanning ports on a firewall looking to see what's open. And then when you find whatever one is open, then you're looking to exploit it overall. We'll do risk, understanding risk assessments, you know, looking at asset management. One of the key rules when it comes to uh, with cybersecurity is know what assets you have so you know how to protect it or that you can protect them. Uh, essentially, if you don't know what you have, you don't know what you can protect. And a lot of the times we see attacks over the years, it's because somebody had a server exposed to the internet, didn't realize it was exposed, and the cyber criminals got in that way. And we see a lot of those different attacks go on that way. Um, looking at threat management, uh, vulnerability management, so all, all these different management programs come into play, whether you're directly engaged with that or it's going to be something you'll have a, a part in. But understanding the different management uh, aspects that are involved with risk. 
Then we've got security controls. And, um, and I'm, like I said, I'm just kind of going these at a high level. But going at, looking at security controls, you'll have physical, administrative, or you'll have a technical control. So your, your physical controls could be locks on doors, could be badge readers, which are ironically then connected into a computer. Um, your technical controls, those are going to be things like firewalls, access control lists, and so forth. Um, and then your administrative controls, user accounts, um, looking at it that way um, for protecting or reducing that risk um, overall. So when we look at controls, when we look at different ways to do it, there are a variety of different guidelines that are out there. And you can use ISO. Uh, depending on the industry you're in, you might be using PCI. So if you're retail or hospitality, um, you're dealing with HIPAA. Uh, you could be dealing uh, with a variety of different types of controls. And they're going to come forward and they're going to stay, OK, thou shalt do x, y, and z. Um, if you look at NIST's uh, cyber risk, the, the, yeah, their cybersecurity framework uh, that they've got, you know, that they break it down into six different areas. And you can correlate and look at the your different controls and, and set it up that way. We get into compliance, you know, and compliance is, you know, the different laws and regulations that are out there. You've got procedures, you've got standards, guidelines that go along with it. The standards, of course, ISO, PCI, um, NIST cybersecurity framework, um, the 27,000 series is most common that you have with ISO. Understand, it's important on this is understanding what the different ones do. You don't have to know all the standards that are underneath that, but you want to understand the difference between what's 27,001 versus 27,002. One sets the standards, the other one kind of tells you the procedures and, and how you want to do that. Uh, and then you have the cybersecurity framework that goes along with it. Once you've got your standards, now you have to create policies. So the standards kind of tell you thou shalt, as security people, thou shalt do X, Y, and Z. Well, that's great. You're going to do that. But what about the rest of your organization? And so within an organization, you have to have policies. And policies dictate what the rules are um, overall. Usually, this is handled by somebody of an upper level. And um, then everybody has to take the training to, so they understand the policy so you guys can all comply. And then governance is what oversees that checking to make sure that what you're saying is written is actually getting done as well. Uh, so making sure you understand what governance is and then how it applies in the organization. And then your procedures are how you do it, you know, step-by-step -step instructions. So if you've got a business continuity plan or you've got a ransomware, if you've got an incident response playbook and there's ransomware in there, and, and, so, and we're going to talk about business continuity in a bit, but having those procedures documented, doing what, you know, you've got it written down on what you say you're going to do overall. So that's the first module. Again, looking at those basic principles. Risk management is a key part. Understanding CIA, how that applies, and then looking at the, the different types of controls that are out there. Um, if uh, when I get done and or afterward, I I'll, um, I think I have my contact information, but I can give you the, I can send you the slide deck that I've got as well. Um, what I'll probably do is, if you're interested, I can put the slide deck in with those six videos, so you can watch and get more detail and, and learning from that as well. So when we look at incident response, business continuity, disaster recovery, this is a critical element because we're looking at trying to keep our organization running. In the event something happens to the organization, whether somebody trips over the power cord and disconnects the server, or you get hit with a lightning strike or a flood and it takes out your systems, you're going to look at those different scenarios a little differently depending on, on what it is. But understanding what the communication process is, understanding the difference between an incident, an event, business continuity, and a disaster recovery plan um, are key elements. And so when you look at incident response, you know, you're looking, and a lot of this is gets dictated through your policy and then your procedures. But looking at, OK, we got to prepare. Now, one of the coolest things you can do to prepare, and depending on how the culture is in your organization, Black Hills Information Security, BHIS, I don't have it on here, unfortunately, but um, if you go out and Google the term, or Google, backdoors and breaches, it is a card game. Anybody like playing Dungeons and Dragons or card, like actual like fantasy card games? This is an InfoSec card game. And basically, you have, you can actually go online and you can play it. If you go out to the Black Hills website, you can see how you can play it online. But basically, you've got different cards for different actions. You've got assets, you've got procedures, you've got policies, you've got attackers, and you've got what happens. And you're basically playing a card game 
of an actual inc of an incident that could occur in the organization and how everybody responds to it. And you roll a dice, and depending on how well you roll the dice or the number you get, depends if whatever action you take to reduce the risk uh, is successful or not. And if it's not, well, then you got to keep trying. So, uh, really, really cool game uh, for going through if you were, because when it comes to your incident response and preparing. It's kind of like, and I said it this morning, when you get on an airplane and they talk about in the event of a water landing, the exits are here, here, and here. Here's how you put on the life vest. They don't expect it to happen, but they want you to be trained and have an understanding. Same thing goes when it comes to incident response. You want to be, you want your people that are in your organization trained so they know how to go through and deal with the incident. If you get hit with a ransomware attack, okay, do we shut the computer down or we just disconnect it from the network? You know, who do we then need to call? Do we got to call the CISO? Do we have to call the CEO? Um, having those conversations and having those plans determined makes life a lot easier. And so an incident response plan is part of that, that life cycle of going through, preparing, figuring out how it all works, um, and then running through the actual exercise. And then when it actually does happen, people aren't freaking out because, oh my God, what do we got to do now? It's like, no, no, no we got to call this, we got to call legal, and we got to call the CISO, and we got to call this person. And you go through that plan so that way you're able to, A, reduce the risk in the organization but then also uh, be able to get recovered and back up and running as quickly as possible. So your incident response plan, understanding how that is set up, understanding the people that are involved, uh, because that is also gonna link back to your business continuity or disaster recovery program. So essentially, when it comes to business continuity, and it's important to understand the difference between the two. Business continuity is in the event that something happens but isn't damaging or detrimental to the organization that's going to have a long-term effect. So a server going down, somebody's computer getting hit with a phishing attack, ransomware attack, just a single incident. That would be a business continuity. Email server going down because of patches on a, you know, middle of a Wednesday night, you know, what is your backup plan to make sure that, you know, you can keep going, people can still keep getting email. That's part of your business continuity plan. Um, and throughout the, the training and information, you know, looking at communicating, you know, if it does happen, what's that process that's involved? And if it is, you do end up having some sort of business continuity issue, there's some sort of kind of like M&M that happened. In the medical world, they have M&Ms where the morbid and mortality to talk about what happened, what went wrong, and how do we fix it? And those things you want to do within a business continuity plan as well as disaster recovery. Because essentially, disaster recovery is that. It's a disaster that's happened. You've lost the data center. The data center got flood, flooded. Um, you've lost power to the building and nobody can do any work. You know? um, and, or it's been damaged. Uh, and the important thing then is going, OK, how do we restore operations? What have we got to do to get back up and running? Living in Florida, we get to deal with the uh, disaster recovery issues of hurricanes. Uh, several years ago, uh, when I was uh, still working at Siemens, we had a hurricane come through and pretty well caused a lot of destruction in Central Florida, trees down, roads closed, people's homes flooded, roofs gone, that kind of thing. Uh, and we had to launch our disaster recovery. The server room in, uh, that we had in Orlando was fine, um, but we ended up losing all of our phone lines. And this was back in the day when we did a lot of phone line work. We had phone lines connected to power plants, and so we had to go through and, and kind of get that uh, operation going again. But like the incident response plan, again, this comes down to preparation, having that documented. documented. What's the impact analysis on a disaster? What's that going to do to our damage to our business? And so understanding that and having those plans um, are important. Understanding what kind of controls you can do in a disaster recovery. Do you have a hot site? Do you have a warm site? Do you have a cold site? Understanding what those three things are and what they mean. Uh, and how they apply. So a cold site is basically a site that's not powered up, but it's got all your equipment and it might have backups of your data. Your warm site is something where, is a site where you're gonna have servers, they might be powered on, they might be getting some backups, but it's gonna take a bit of extra effort to restore data and get them up. The hot site is basically just a mirror image of what you've already got running, that you might have in your data center, or you might have in your cloud environment. So. Those are three different types of your disaster recovery sites, but understanding those um, as well. Looking at, you know, and the pandemic was a, was a prime example with regards to business continuity and with disaster recovery, because we're talking about 
you know, people cannot go in the office. How are people going to do work? All right, now we're going to have to get people at home working remotely. How do we handle that? That pretty well set off a lot of incident responses that nobody was prepared for, or disaster recoveries that nobody was prepared for. So there were a lot of lessons learned that came out of that, but now people are, are ready with it when it comes to those things. And so when you have a disaster happen, again, it's important that those um, lessons that occur afterward uh, are happening. All right, so looking at, so we've covered the system principle, the system controls, uh, talking about risk management, and then talking uh, different way, business continuity and response. So now looking at the controls, now we're looking at how do we protect the systems and understanding what goes involved or what's involved in doing that essentially. Utilizing defense in depth. Um, you know, you think about a castle. It had a moat, it had huge walls, and then when you got inside the castle, then you had other buildings, and inside those buildings would be other rooms that would be locked, and inside those rooms, there might be a chest, and in there is where all the treasure is. That's defense in depth. There's multiple layers that you've got to get through, and we see the same thing in cybersecurity as well, right? We've got different layers. We have firewalls that have MFA that you get inside the network. You're authenticated as a user. Now you're going to have assets or data that need to be protected. How are you protecting that? Additional MFA whatever it may be um, that comes in there, other firewalls that, that are in there. Uh, life cycle management of your users. You know, onboarding is always easy to do, get somebody on board, but then what happens when they leave the company? What's that off, what's that life cycle look like overall? Dealing with identica uh, identification, authentication, authorization, auditing, the IAAA that comes after that. Um, understanding how logs can collect data. Uh, what's important with those logs, how long do you retain them, and a lot of that's going to fall back on what your requirements were based off your policy. Um, looking at different model access based on your users. Uh, yeah, so as we look at controls, uh, you know, looking at different countermeasures, different ways that we can be able to protect data and systems overall. And of course, when it comes to controls, we're, we're still talking about risk. We're still talking about being able to protect an asset or something within our organization. And essentially, we're protecting subjects, objects, or there's going to be rules that are associated with that. So subject could be a user or client. It, it could be active, uh, where they need a particular service or application. Um, and then is there any type of approval that goes along with that subject to give them or provide them access? And an object essentially is anything that a subject is going to access. So whether a user or an application, and then they've got a variety of different uh, ways that you're going to be able to handle that access overall. Um, is there a data classification? That kind of thing. Then you've got the rules, of course. So how long do they have access for? When do we give them access? What are they accessing? Uh, allows and denies. And of course, least user privilege comes into play there as well. So risk, as I said, risk is extremely important because it's all about what we do is all about reducing risk. And I can tell that when I talk about risk and I can see it, because I always see it with my students, it's like, oh my God, this is so dry. Okay, fine, I get it, risk, yeah. So I kind of came up with something fun that we can do here. We're going to start with an asset. But this asset is Superman. And we're all members of the Hall of Justice. Now I'm getting eyes, raised eyebrows going, oh my God, he's lost his mind. But no, no, bear with me here. This is, there's a point to this. So we're all members of the Hall of Justice. We've got to take care, we've got to protect Superman, right? Okay. So when we look at risk, we're dealing with threats, vulnerabilities, and consequences. So here we have, you know, we'll call him a bank robber, trying to shoot a gun at Superman. Is this person a threat to Superman? No, because we know that bullets bounce off him. No threat. He's got no capability to hurt Superman whatsoever. Cool. Depends on the type of bullet. Okay, well, we'll just call he's got a shotgun, you know. Doesn't have a kryptonite bullet. The Incredible Hulk. Is the Incredible Hulk a uh, threat to Superman? No. Why? Superman. He's Superman. <laughs> well, he's not a threat because he doesn't have any opportunity. Because the Incredible Hulk's part of the Marvel Universe and Superman's part of the DC Universe. They do crossovers. They do crossovers. They actually did a YouTube video, Superman fighting the Incredible Hulk. It was pretty neat. But to give the example of the Incredible Hulk doesn't have the opportunity. Then we got Lex Luthor. Well, he's motivated. He's got access. Uh, and he's considered a possible threat because if he gets his hands on some kryptonite, then he can seriously be you know, that kind of uh, threat to Superman. But when we look at um, 
the intent. He's got the intent. He's got the capability because if he gets his hands on some kryptonite, um, there is that opportunity. So we can look at Lex Luthor as being a threat to Superman. Whether how he carries that out or what he can do remains to be seen. But Superman's vulnerability is not kryptonite. It's his physiology as he is with the yellow sun. That's where he gets the strength from, is the yellow sun. The um, kryptonite basically um, is a weapon. It's not a vulnerability. It's what can be used against Superman to attack him. So in the end, you know, if we look at the, the consequence of all this, you know, Lex Luthor could defend him, defeat Superman if he had that kryptonite ray gun. But you know, we know that Superman always comes through in the end, or, us, or the Hall of Justice folks come through and they help him out. But when we look at you know, Superman is the asset, looking at the threats, looking at what the risks are, and making sure that we can reduce that risk overall to protect Superman. And the same thing kind of goes with our homes as well. You know, what can we do? And I mentioned it earlier. You know, what are the things that we can do to help reduce risk of where we live, whether it's an apartment, whether it's a house, you know, whether we're in a gated community or, or just our home, you know, make sure we keep the windows locked, the front doors locked, uh, have the different alarms. What are the different ways cyber, uh, burglars could break in and what can we do to be able to protect it? That's kind of the same thing that we're dealing with in cybersecurity and we want to reduce that risk. Uh, a lot of the time it could be dependent on the effectiveness of the control. You know, you're, you want to go through and do assessments and audits on our security measures, going through and making sure we got a scope. And this is where auditing comes in. Uh, but understanding how often do we do it, what type of, uh, what's involved in that, and then what, what's the plan to um, either remediate uh, the, the risk, if the, or the mitigate the risk if there is any, um, and then whether, and usually those decisions get made by upper management, but it's important to understand the different uh, control assessments and uh, how, that, how they all work together. Uh, looking at defense in depth, Again, talking about before with the castle, we're doing different controls. We've got a physical control. So if we think about servers that we've got on-prem, and if we don't have servers on-prem, then you know, they're in the cloud. How do we control those logical controls? Physical controls we can do. We can have badges. We can have locks. We can do different things there. Logical and technical controls are going to come from you know, user identification, uh, authentication, uh, and then authorization coming through with the admin controls before we get to the assets. So looking at you know, ways that we can layer the critical data and information and stuff that we've got. Least privilege, understanding, it's important to understand the concept of least privilege. Of course, a lot of time it's easier said than done. A lot of folks, a lot of organizations, they're really good at isolating users' accounts, but then making sure that they're going through and auditing and checking those as well. <laughs> so understanding the, the concept of least privilege. Uh, looking at users, looking at the life cycle of a user, coming on board, going through and doing audits on their account, making sure they still need access to certain things, that kind of thing. Uh, and then going through and making sure we're verifying who they are. Segregations of duties, looking, and this, this has been a long time uh, concept where you'll have somebody that will need access to a particular asset or, or data or whatever. You'll have somebody that approve it, either the manager of the asset, uh, and then it gets approved. But then also the segregation of duties, making sure that you know, if you've got access to critical information, that you can't just have one person that's got all the keys to the kingdom. Far too many times over the years, we've seen and heard stories of sysadmins taking control, locking out accounts, um, those things. Uh, dual controls, uh, you know, again, relating to segregation of duty, but understanding having dual controls kind of like MFA overall. Your, Looking at controlling physical access, you know, we're looking at that physical concept. You know, when it comes to you know things like a data center or where the server, the server room that you might have, where the networking equipment is, that would want to be um, protected a, a little more. And that's going to come down to environmental design. You know, do you have bollards? Do you have gates? Do you need a badge to get in? Um, understanding what those different, how the different elements of the environment can can help as well. Uh, you've got access controls doing different way, understanding the difference between DAC and RBAC, uh, looking at those, uh, who gets to control the authentication, and then who handles um, what access they get to as well. You've got access control lists. We see these in networking devices, understanding the in-screen allow, deny, implicit, you know, the firewalls and the routers, monitoring, and so forth, uh, but making sure that those are reviewed and checked as well. So moving on to 
networking devices. So this is now the this is the fifth um, fourth module. Uh, but networking, who deals with networking on a regular basis? Got a couple. Cool. So uh, if I asked you, if it, could you recite the OSI model right off the top of your head? Nope. Don't. Nope. Yeah. Okay. It's always fun to you know. Um, I, I know within teaching the networking uh, the networking class, you know, it's always about remembering the OSI model. You know, nowadays you just got on your phone, and you can look it up. But um, understanding the different layers uh, and essentially, you know, coming through with wide area networks. Wow, that's really small. Sorry about that. Uh, but looking at wide area, you know, when you've got your different networkings, um, your LANs, your WANs, your clouds, your MANs, your metropolitan area networks, your local area networks, understanding the difference between all those different networks. Um, then you have the OSI model, the application presentation session, transport network data link physical. Understanding all of those different layers, understanding what um, each one does and what's happening at that layer, uh, being able to basically talk as a packet would be able to go through uh, each one of those different uh, layers. Understanding those and being able to uh, apply that. Um, understanding, looking at hardware, traffic, you know, hardware, the different limitations you may have with network, uh, with the networking, essentially with, you know, attenuation, you know, how far, how long of a network cable can you have uh, before it starts, you start having latency uh, issues as well. And so basically it's important to go through and look at each of them. And so looking at the data link layer, layer two, um, you're at the addressing, your, your physical address, the MAC address, um, understanding how that works and what that comprises of. Uh, looking at your traffic that's going to go through, filtering, spoofing, you know, uh, spoofing is always fun, whether it's ARP spoofing or IP spoofing, MAC spoofing, uh, but looking at how that all works and, and what needs to be done to protect against it. Your network layer, your IP address, your logical addresses, understanding how those work, breaking it down on the 32-bit address, um, understanding the difference between public and private addresses uh, is a key element. And then, of course, talking about IPv6. That's a fun topic altogether in itself, uh, but understanding the reason why that came about and um, you know how the the security that's built into that. We look at the network layer. You know, again, continuing that migration, why IPv6 came along, um, and then understanding the different different devices, routers, firewalls uh, that you're going to have on that layer. We look at the transport layer. You know, the, this is so now we're again hardware. You've got your routers and firewalls, port numbers. Uh, understanding different protocols, TCP, UDP, at that level. So understanding not only the levels, but what protocols apply in there is key as well. The known, at least have a good, strong understanding of the different ports that are there. So, you know, whether TCP 23 is Telnet, 21 FTP, 80 HTTP, 443 HTTPS, uh, and so forth. Um, knowing that you've got clear text on some of the older ports, but then what are the more secure ones that are out there? So understanding secure shell, FTPS, HTTPS, and so forth. Your session layer, now we're basically going from that logical aspect, uh, looking at the different protocols that are there, your, you know, your uh, password authentication pro protocol, remote procedure call, um, looking at you know, your RDP, looking at the different protocols that are at that layer, understanding what you've got there. Your presentation layer, and again, looking at what protocols are there, what's happening at this level. Here we see where we've got encryption and decryption. So whether we're looking at you know, the triple DES, we're looking at AES, CBC, whatever it may be. Um, and, then if, and then we get to the application layer. So now it's in, within um, the application. This isn't the application itself, but essentially you know, it might be a web application firewall. It could be, uh, this is where it's getting to the end of the user. And we look at encapsulation. So essentially, looking at uh, looking at the, the the packet itself as it as it travels through, what's within there, the frame, the segment, um, and so forth. But it's un, it's important that you understand everything's important, but understanding what um, how the packet is made up, the different parts of it, the header um, segments, and so forth. Looking at spoofing, you know whether you can spoof the MAC address at layer two, the IP address at three. Uh, understanding DNS spoofing, because that's always, and which brings about DNSSEC. Uh, and then also understanding the different attacks that can happen on the different layers. Man in the middle, understanding how that works. Uh, bypassing security controls. The different, how different attacks can go across the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Knowing about phishing. 
and not just with the rod and the reel, but uh, how, how it gets used, the difference between spear phishing as well. A lot of times cyber criminals will create fake doppelganger type websites, um, and then kind of how the user plays a role in all of this. Um, I know for this, I've got hours and hours of material uh, on phishing and, and protection of that. Denial of service attacks, you know, the 404, but essentially, and for me, when it comes to denial of service, this connects more into availability, looking at, um, you know, taking systems down, but then how do you pr protect against that from happening, whether you're using a third-party service or whatever it may be, uh, but understanding the, the elements of that. Viruses, I think that's pretty straightforward. Worms, kind of the same thing, knowing that virus, worms, and Trojans, oh my, uh, you know, all part of that malware family, understanding the different elements and what they do. Uh, on path attacks, you know, again, man in the middle, how they use them, how they work. Side channel attacks, we see a lot of these in websites, but it's, uh, you know, they're always looking to be able to get information without being very obvious or being uh, right in, in front of you, so to speak. Uh, so then being, and then we're looking at identifying threats. So we've kind of gone through a lot of the different attack vectors but looking at different ways that it works, what we can do intelligent-wise, threat intelligence, if you work in a SOC or working with a team that does threat intelligence. And again, that all goes back to identifying threats and looking at the risk management overall. And of course, one of the tools we deal with within a SOC is the SIM, understanding the SIM and how that works, um, alerting the processing of it, uh, communication paths that, that may come out of it afterward. Honeypots, these are always fun. If you ever set up your own honeypot at home in a lab just to see what kind of uh, activity you might get. A lot of the time honeypots get used um, to see what the kind of tactics cr cyber criminals are using. And so honeypots are, are very uh, fun, or get used a lot with that. Vulnerability scanners, you know, looking at being able to understand what those do, you know, whether it's Nessus, whether it's OpenVAS, whatever it may be. The, 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 Exam will never cover a particular product, but it'll talk about the concepts individually. How you prevent threats, of course, patching, you know, understanding, uh, can you patch all the vulnerabilities? But looking at, you know, prioritizing and understanding how that works. Change management, because a lot of organizations you want to go through in a process of when you make updates to systems. Uh, antivirus, it's pretty straightforward. Understanding firewalls, the different levels that they operate, again, going back to the OSI layer model. Uh, your data center, understanding that concept, what, what you'll find in there, how, how you have a data center that's got a high availability and what that percentage looks like and what you've got to spend and, uh, and understanding how to do the access control, the monitoring, and so forth. Network closets and cabinets, we've got those inside organizations, even small businesses, medium businesses, but understanding what goes in there, maintenance, uh, and so forth. Looking at the physical controls, again, fire suppression, that's always a, uh, a fun topic because we don't want to lose a fire, don't want to lose a data center to a fire. Uh, but, our, but when it comes to, ironically, you got to understand what the three different fire extinguishers, the ABC, uh, for those. Memorandum of understanding, uh, which I always thought was interesting to put in this, but essentially, these, this is touching upon the legal aspects that we, we cover in CISSP. But an MOU, essentially, knowing what that term is and how it's used between parties. Contract service level agreements. Uh, these always get fun when you make, you're up in senior management or a CISO because they're always dealing with this, uh, with third parties, IT managers, uh, and so forth. Cloud services, and I know a lot of us probably use a lot of cloud. Uh, I know I've got, uh, personally, I've been using Azure for uh, remote systems. When I'm on the road, it's a lot easier to have a server in the cloud and I can access it from anywhere. But understanding the different elements that go into having a cloud uh, infrastructure, bandwidth, latency, so forth. Looking at the different characteristics, you know, you're gonna have different costs associated with, you know, what kind of backups, what kind of availability, uh, and so forth. Software as a service, you know, we use a lot of those inside organizations, but then third party, you're dealing a lot of with service level. Uh, you're also dealing with supply chain, where we've seen it with SolarWinds, if you remember that from a couple of years ago. We had Move It earlier this year, two organizations that got hit that were servicing so many other organizations that ended up getting hit as well, um, and looking at that. Platform as a service, understanding those terms. Again, going back to service level agreements, looking at uh, information to protect it. Infrastructure as a service, uh, understanding the different service cloud models, 
looking at network segmentation. Again, this is where defense in depth comes in. So you've got those different layers overall, firewalls, systems. Um, and then, you know, here's a good example of kind of how to break it down with the different users um, and everything else that's going on. Concepts, understanding zero trust. Uh, basically, nobody's trusted inside the organization. You've always got to authenticate coming in. Um, and especially zero trust that we see a lot in the cloud. Network access control, looking at the ports, looking at what gets used, making sure that those devices get updated as well. Virtual local area networks, you know, now we're talking about the virtual networks with relating to VLANs, looking at, you know, whether it's multiple networks going through the one cable. Virtual private networks themselves specifically, under, the, in understanding the importance of why you have them, where you use them, um, the cons and the technology that goes in, what layer they operate, and so forth. All right, before I get into security operations, is this, because I'm curious, because this is, a, I am going quite fast with this. Is the information what I'm giving you informative? Is it helpful? Is this stuff you already know? Is there something you want me to cover a little more? Or just keep going? Just keep going? Okay, all right, cool. I know it can get dry, and I do apologize, and I can make the slides and the videos available for you. Uh, so that you can go back and review it. I'm just curious, is anybody interested in taking or th considering taking the CC? Oh, okay, very cool, all right. And as I said at the beginning, a lot of this is all the kind of that introductory. If you've been going in school and you've been learning all about networking and you've been learning about uh, the, the pen testing aspects and securing servers and, and Linux and stuff, which is what I, uh, I teach at, at, the, at the college, this is now getting more into kind of that theoretical aspect, understanding the OSI model layer, understanding how that breaks down. And maybe you've already done all, studied all that, which is great, because uh, that's gonna make it a lot easier for you in the exam overall. So with the security operations, now we're looking at, you know, how we maintain security in the organization, what needs to be done, uh, looking at asset retention policies, looking at the different systems, what do we need to keep the organization secure, what programs we need in place, uh, and then looking at encryption. Yeah, they weren't going to let you get away without studying some type of encryption overall, whether it's symmetric, asymmetric, um, and the hashing uh, that goes on there as well. Uh, understanding the fact that you've got to have inventories, understanding you've got to have asset controls. Like I said earlier, I said, you know, you can't protect what you don't know you don't have because that's an easy way for cyber criminals to get in. Uh, having training, education, and awareness within the organization on security. Uh, whether that's somebody that's responsible for doing that. Uh, so looking at data handling, you know, when we, when we talk about data handling, data loss prevention is part of in there. We may have classification of data where it's unrestricted, restricted. It could be something where it's uh, confidential or top secret. But going through and how we classify that compared to, you know, the type of risk that if it got out, what kind of problems is that going to present for the organization overall? Again, so looking at classification, depending on your organization, may depend on how many classification levels you've got. You know, if you're in the military, they've got, I think, four or five. Um, but that top secret one needs a clearance, which is a lot of background checks and a whole lot of money to get spent. Uh, whereas if it's public information, it may not, it, it would be just open for everybody. Um, but having classification, having that policy, having that program in place, Understanding what has to be protected goes also goes in with your business impact analysis as well. Um, labeling it again, that's your part of your classification, deciding what level it's at, your confidential, strictly confidential, so forth. You may have a retention policy or program where you know what is being retained. You know, if you're a law firm, you've got to retain information for a certain amount of time. Some of the compliance requirements that are out there, you got to keep data for seven years. So it's a matter of understanding what that retention policy looks like. Um, who's making the decision to retain the information, protect it? How is that being stored? Uh, understanding that. And then when you got to get rid of data, uh, you know, you get to the end of the seven years, and it's like, okay, we don't need to keep these emails, or we don't need to keep this certain data. Uh, you know, having having that where you're what you're going through and understanding how we get rid of it, what is it we need to get rid of. How does it go into cold storage or does it completely get destroyed? Uh, and then also a lot of that gets tied into your regulatory compliance. If you've got particular requirements with a particular standard, we'll require that. Logging, essentially, we're already probably doing lots of logging off all kinds of systems already. 
Uh, there may be certain requirements and understanding what those different requirements are, uh, being able to apply those. How do you protect the logs? Because cyber criminals, when they get in, they want to cover their tracks and they'll go through and delete logs and entries uh, to hide that. And then also centralizing it, understanding how you have to, how you can centralize it, what tools you might use. It could be a SIM, uh, whatever that may be. Then you've got monitoring and understanding how, what systems need to be monitored, what you're using to monitor that, whether you're going through and then auditing those to make sure that the information collected is correct and that you have the right information, it's not being changed. Automated with the SIEM, understanding the SIEM overall. Uh, then we've got encryption, and of course encryption is always a fun topic, but essentially looking at the three different areas, the uh, symmetric, the actual encryption, and then the hashing itself. A lot of that all comes into your confidentiality, your integrity, and the availability and the privacy, all those elements working together. You have that encryption to be able to protect that so folks can't read it. Your hashing, understanding that process, it's a one-way pass, looking at the different links that you might have uh, with regards to the different types of hashing that can occur, which ones are good, which ones don't work anymore, uh, and which ones um, are the better ones to use. And then overall, understanding that you're basically creating that fingerprint of a file or whatever, or an item, an asset, uh, but learning and or having a look at what the different uses are. A lot of the time, if you download software from a, a website, they'll give you a hash of what it should be because they want to make sure that whatever you download is still the same file they put on their server, and the hash basically just makes sure that it doesn't get altered through the download, uh, your man-in-the-middle attack overall. Asset re uh, inventory, if you ever look at the Center for uh, Information Security, their number one and number two deals with asset inventory. Asset inventory of hardware and asset inventory of software. So it's important to make sure that you've got those or somebody is make, creating those and maintaining them and, and then also the information that goes along with it, how long it's been operating, you know, and then there'll be maybe other information that gets associated with it. But essentially, it's all coming back to making sure you understand what you have. And even now with software, when we start looking at third-party systems, we start looking at what are called S-bombs, bill of materials, a software bill of material. You'll get a hardware bill of material if you buy a piece of hardware. It'll tell you what, what's inside the system hardware-wise. You know, If you ever go buy a computer from Dell or, or whatever, they'll tell you all the specs and what's inside of it. But when you buy software, you really don't get that ingredients list. You don't get told what's in there. And so part of your asset inventory wants to include third-party systems that you're working with and their software and what's in, uh, inside of it. Change management, they, essentially we're talking about when you've got to make changes in inventory, changes to the systems, patch management. This is where your change management comes in. Having a detailed, repeatable, documented process being able to go through what's that process look like when you've got to get management to approve it, what that time frame is. Again, then you're looking at service level agreements as well. Oops, went the wrong way. Doing updates, you know, we, we do updates, you know, from Microsoft, second Tuesday of every month. Uh, but then we're also looking at client applications as well. How often those get updated, if it's internal or third party, web systems, operating systems, uh, and hardware as well. And of course, a lot of that can come down as an impact from supply chain security. So products that we're getting from other organizations, you know, what is going into it, how often are they doing those updates as well. Then looking at baselines and controls, looking at, you know, access encryption, um, how we monitor it, uh, the different monitoring that goes on, having a baseline, having that all documented within your um, asset inventory along with your policies, your procedures, and, and so forth. This is all part of that documentation that you're going to have. Um, and essentially breaking it down and being able to um, categorize it and um, be also based on the risk level that you may have with it. Is it a low asset, is it a high asset, medium asset? So it could be an HR system that has everybody's social security numbers, addresses, PII information. That could be considered a medium system. But your server that's got all your intellectual property data, that if that were to be stolen or hit with ransomware, you're basically going to be having to go bankrupt because you won't be able to produce any widgets or have a service or whatever because your intellectual property has been um, shut down. Say which is do, do what you say. A lot of the time uh, this is, you know, policies, standards are based off of the fact that, you know, it's that documented, repeatable process that you're going through. Um, having those statements and then being having it repeatable and then showing that you have followed through on it and that documentation is important. 
Um, change management we touched upon already. You know, what's in scope when you're doing a change management? Who's involved? Who's doing the updates? Uh, understanding that consistency is important, being able to go through and do it repeatedly. You might have a privacy policy, but understanding what that privacy policy does for the organization. Is it privacy for the employees? Is it privacy of data that you're getting from other organizations as they're using a service for you? Uh, and again, that's gonna tie back to some sort of compliance or regulatory through your governance risk uh, program that you have. And then, of course, one of my favorite topics is always, who's responsible for security? You know, we can't do, can't do security without you, right? Um, but while, and, and this is still an ongoing issue, where, yeah, the board might, if you're a publicly traded company, the board might be responsible, but a lot of the time, and we've seen this in the past already, it happened at Uber, but that was for a different reason, but organizations that get hit with um, some sort of data breach, uh, the CISO shortly thereafter ends up losing their job, but the board still stays intact. So there's been a, lo a lot of discussion trying to get that accountability to shift to the board of directors or upper management, uh, so that way you keep your CISO, because they've got the experience to deal with an incident if you end up having it. Uh, but having people in your organization trained, made aware, you have that education so that they understand phishing, they understand you know, the hardware rules that you've got, that physical security, logical uh, security that you're doing as we talked about earlier. But uh, making sure that people understand what they're responsible for. Training, and that's gonna be across the board, depending on whether it's IT training or security training for your IT security folks, but then also training for your users as well. Uh, looking at, Anybody that's got an email address in that organization should have some type of security awareness training because, in my opinion, they've got a key to the front door. they got a key to the electric front door because they can click on a link and the cyber criminals can come walking in. Again, awareness, uh, whether that's physically or electronically with um, understanding clean desk policies, that's always a big item, which I think is kind of interesting because if you work from home, how do they know I don't have a clean desk? The uh, confidential waste disposal, this is always a fun one because we talk about dumpster diving. I've uh, seen a lot of, you know, you see a lot of Hollywood movies, you get the, they're going to look for information, so they go dive into the diver dumpster and they pull out, hey, look, we found X, Y, Z or whatever relating to the information they're finding. Uh, but looking at different ways you can train and provide awareness to your users through training programs, email, posters, lunch and learns, whatever it may be. And then within the security controls, you're going through and essentially measure. You always got to have data. Who has, he who has, or they who have the data wins. And having data goes a long way. Uh, being able to measure your security program, going through your audits, understanding how you go through and do that, um, looking at the training content, but then also looking at how often you go and do it. Uh, one of my favorite kind of analogies is the fact that you can't go to the gym one day out of the year and expect to be all muscular and tone and, and fit, right? No, you gotta go like three times a week to the gym. You know, they got leg, leg day and arm day, back day, cardio, whatever it is, but you're constantly working at it. Same thing applies here. We need to constantly be getting our users to make sure that they're trained and aware, like ourselves as well, with regards to current threats, uh, things that are going on. Social engineering, uh, knowing what social engineering is, how it works with phishing, spear phishing, whaling, uh, with open source intelligence as well, uh, how cyber criminals are able to go out and find information about an organization and use that to attack the organization to build that rapport, build that trust with the user. So uh, make sure you have that understanding and can define social engineering. All right, so you've gone through and you've taken all the training, you've seen the videos, you've got this all committed to memory, you could teach a class on the CC. So now what? So now you wanna go get your certification. And essentially, as I said before, um, there's no work experience needed with this one. There's no years of experience. You can basically, as if you studied the material and you're ready to take the exam, then you can sit for the exam. The first step is you gotta go through and you know, take the exam. Once you pass it, again, you need the 700 out of 1,000 uh, points. You then sign off on the ISC square, or the ISC 2 Code of Ethics you're agreeing that you're going to abide by those ethics act, act honorably, justly, legally, um, so, so forth. Um, then you pay an annual maintenance fee. And with the ISC2, I think, I think it's gonna be $75 a year, but they waive it the first year. So basically, once you pass your certification, you've already gotten a free voucher for taking the exam, and if you've passed, 
great. Now you get your first year waived, and basically after that, you're just going through and paying your annual maintenance fee. Um, you, with your annual maintenance fee, you have to obtain a certain number of continuing education credits. So coming to a conference like this, if you were here yesterday and today, you could probably get 12 CPEs. Six hours each day is kind of what I'm guessing. But you'd get 12 CPEs. And I know for the CISSP, I have to have 40 a year, 40 hours. And I, I think I've got a slide in here. But there are different things you can do to uh, earn those CPEs, whether you go to conferences, you go to meetings, you read books, you take um, ISC2 has a magazine that you can go online and read and take a quiz. They've got webinars that happen pretty well every day that are an hour long. You can go and watch those and get an hour long, get a CPE for that. So getting the certification is the first step. It's maintaining that certification is what uh, gets involved that where you've got to be a little more active. Um, like I said, if you do presentations, you can get CPEs. So, oh, question? No? Oh, stretching the right. Uh, the Code of Ethics, again, I mentioned at the beginning, acting honorably, justly, responsibly, and legally. Then you'll schedule the exam, and it's usually done at Pearson uh, or Pearson View. You'll create an account. If you've taken exams with them before, you're, you're familiar with the process. But basically, uh, you'll visit the facility and um, find them a location center near you, take, pick it at a time, and then you pay for the exam. And that's where the voucher comes in that you get from ISC2. Um, if you have special accommodations or needs when taking the exam, you can uh, coordinate through that, through the member support uh, with ISC2. They need to let Pearson View know of whatever that accommodation is going to be, and then um, you show up. Uh, when it comes to exam day, you know you want to make sure you're there early, beforehand, just like any other certification. You want to be showing up there right at your scheduled time and have a problem. Um, they make you sign an NDA. If something happens, and trust me, I know life can get in the way, but if something happens and you got to reschedule, uh, you got to call at least 24 hours before. If it's the day of, I think uh, I, I'm not fully aware of how Pearson View does it, but um, if you end up missing the exam, you can you've lost that slot, so you have to reschedule. Uh, you may have to pay again at that point. Uh, you got to bring two forms of ID. I always thought that was interesting, but you got to bring two forms of ID. Uh, driver's license, one of them. I'm not sure whether you bring a passport. I think I brought my passport with me. Um, but it, most of the time, it probably could be some other piece of mail, like an electricity bill or something like that, uh, with your name and address on it. Uh, you, they do a palm vein scan. They authenticate that it's you. So it's that you know, additional authentication. They take your pictures, so don't bring any hats, no sunglasses. Um, and you, I remember, has anybody ever taken an exam at Pearson View before? A handful of you? I, 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 I was ready for them to hand, hand me a jumpsuit. Get out of the clothes you're wearing and put this you know, paper jumpsuit on while you take the exam. Because everything I had, and they tell you don't bring anything into the exam room except your ID, maybe your phone. But even then when you go in, you put everything you have in a locker. And then, I, no, they didn't pat me down, but it felt like they were going to do that next. Um, but you have to leave all your personal belongings inside of a drawer. Uh, and then they escort you into the room and you sit and take the exam. And I, if you're like me, when it comes to taking exams, there's a certain level of anxiety because you know, you're taking the questions and you're answering it and you're like, oh my gosh, I hope I got this right. Uh, I, did a, I did my SACP, which is certify, um, Security Awareness and Culture Professional a couple years ago. And even, I knew all the material, I knew all the information, uh, but even still sitting for that exam, I'm like, man, I hope I pass this because if I don't, it's not gonna be good. But just the anxiety and the nervousness up there uh, is, is certainly evident and, and can happen. Oh, there we go. Original documents. Primary must be your photo and signature. Secondary must include your signature. So Social Security card? I don't know. I do credit card. You do credit card? Oh, OK. Cool. The time I went there and they said, this one's not signed. And I said, OK, I'll be right back. Last you walked out, signed it, and walked back in? Yeah. Yeah, I always find that pretty funny. Your name matching, so make sure how you're registered, how your driver's license is, your actual identification should be what's when you register as well. Um, if, if the name, uh, if it doesn't match, they won't let you in. Oh, see, there you go. Here's all the accepted uh, primary ID, school ID, credit cards, signed. Um, yep, signature and not expired, so there you go. Uh, you're on your credit card, so you can't, even, you can't bring an expired credit card. Uh, 
military ID will work. Um, secondary, social security card, there you go, ATM card, credit card, um, anything that's on, or another primary ID one will work as well. Don't bring any guns. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. um, law enforcement can, but that's about it. You know. You'll have about five minutes to review the non-disclosures. That's why you want to be there early. Can't take the exam if you don't accept the NDA, because basically what you're doing in the NDA, non-disclosure agreement, is you're saying that you won't talk about the test to anybody. You won't share what the questions are. You're going to keep it secret, that kind of a thing. Um, you can take breaks if you need to during the exam, uh, but it does count against your testing time. So you have two hours to take the exam. So if you're 10 questions in and you gotta go to the bathroom and uh, you take half an hour to go to the bathroom, well then you're lost a half an hour worth of time. So yeah, it's done in the testing environment inside Pearson View. Um, you are allowed to wear um, earplugs, but I, you're not allowed to wear headphones which is obvious because you know, they don't want you to listen to your audio recording of you reading the book. Uh, once you're done, then you just raise your hand, they'll come over, they take you out. And I remember when I finished, when I did the Pearson view, for me, it was like you hit enter and then the screen goes blank and it goes, all right, go outside to get your results. And as I walked out, they escort you out again and they <coughs> wand you down or check me again, uh, making sure I wasn't, I guess, bringing anything illegal out or any notes that I'd taken. Um, and then they hand you the piece of paper and it's folded and there was no expression on their face, and I'm thinking, crap, I failed it. Open it up and I passed. But it was just very solemn and very uh, concerning because that long walk, it was literally a walk from here to there, but it felt like a long walk as you're walking to get your exam results and waiting for it. Um, sometimes there may be technical uh, issues at the site, in which case you, you'll have to reschedule. Uh, if you see someone cheating, you, you know, again, acting honorably, justly, you want to report it. Um, afterward, you know, you'll be given an, they give, they give you the unofficial result because it's still got to get verified, but you know, if you pass, you pass. Um, they'll email you, this says they'll email you the candidate results. Oh, do they email it? Okay. I thought they would give you the printout right there. Um, if you pass, they'll, you'll get directions on how to complete the survey. Oh, okay. I, sorry, misread. Um, so if you passed, they, they let you know right there and then. Um, if you didn't, they'll let you know right there and then and what you need to work on. Uh, but basically the next steps then is you are looking to get certified by IAC2 and there's their endorsement process as well. Um, we know it's stressful taking these exams. I know personally from my own experience. Um, it's multiple choice questions. And the thing I don't like about it and what they do is the fact that you can't go back to previous questions. So you have to answer it. Um, so it's, it's important that either take the time that you need to, because I know for me, when I, when I sat for the CISSP, when it was paper and pencil, uh, that was years ago, I actually failed my CISSP the first time I took it. I missed it by six points. And so I immediately turned around and said, all right, I'm gonna take it again, took the boot camp, had the same instructor because I liked the way they delivered the material. And during the week, I found myself helping educate and talk with other people about the material, teach them, so to speak, or talk about it. Um, and then when I remember sitting for the exam the second time, the first 10 questions that I hit, I didn't like the answers that it provided because I didn't, there was something about them that was like, it wasn't right, or it was the answer that I was looking for to give it. Uh, and so I ended up having to go back because a lot of the time these exams, they want you to give the best possible answer, it may not be the right answer, but the best possible answer. There's always one that's wrong, there's two that's close, and then there's the right answer. Uh, but for me, it was a matter of having to go back and review it, uh, and, uh, but here with the adaptive exam, it, it's not possible. You know, uh, my wife is a, uh, now practically a retired school teacher, but we used to do, she dealt a lot with the standardized testing. And even when I was doing my CISSP and, and the SACP cert, you know, those test taking tips that we learned back in elementary school actually still play out. Um, you know, looking at, looking at the responses, reading the question, looking at the responses again, um, you know, and again, you're looking to select that best answer overall. You know, make sure, well, back in the days of bubbling in, you have to circle in all the way, but, um, and also from a answering standpoint, sometimes it's good to go with your gut. My wife and I, we watch Jeopardy every night. And usually on Final Jeopardy, it comes up, and she's smart, uh, smarter than me. 
uh, so much so that she was on it back in 2012. But we're sitting there on Final Jeopardy, and she'll talk about and go, um, she'll give an answer, and she's like, well, and she'll start thinking about it. I'm like, no, 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 go with your gut, because that's what you always said to me. You go with your gut. So you, you know you're going to have that initial reaction for a particular answer. Analysis leads to paralysis. So you know if you're reading too much into it, um, if it's a short question, it's going to have a quick answer or short answer. If it's a long uh, and complex question, it's going to have a complex answer as well. Um, Performance-based questions, you can flag for review. Uh, these came from a buddy of mine, these tips. Uh, it's also time management's important. So you, as you're, if, you, if you're doing practice tests, look to see how long you're taking those. Sometimes you can write reminders down information, but I, I think with this, because you can't go back, um, while you might be able to take notes. And also, you know, let's say you've memorized the OSI model and it, it You've memorized it just before you go in, because as soon as you go in, they give you a notepad, and you write down the OSI model real quick. That way you can go back to refer to it. You're able to do that. Um, capitalize words, rest and relax, always have a good night's sleep, have a good breakfast. You know, Those are always the fun tips as well. Um, and again, write down what you know. If there's a lot of information that you've, you're cramming into your brain the morning of, you know, write it all down when you get into the, uh, into the exam room. Uh, beta questions. You never know what they are, and they always create new questions. They don't tell you which ones, so you're never quite sure that whether you know one that seemed really weird was a beta question or not. As I said, I'm going to give you the slide deck because there's a whole slew of resources here, uh, different books that you can get for test taking with regards to the certified uh, in cybersecurity notes, the books, the different ones. There's some online ones that you can take through Udemy, uh, and those are available as well. So. That's everything that I had with regards to this certification um, and with test taking. Any questions regarding any of the material or any, think about the exam? Holy crap, when are we going to take this? No, good thing it's not a boot camp. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I think I heard you say there were videos available to, to prepare and study with. Uh, yeah, I, um, I have, I got them on my Dropbox folder. Okay. So the, the, um, at the college where I teach, one of my students actually went and sat uh, for the CC. And when he did, he got the, um, the videos. They give you six videos when you, and uh, he turned to me and goes, you want a copy? And I'm like, yeah, I want a copy. So I have those. So what I'll probably do is, um, I've got my business card here. You guys can email me. Where do I have it? Certified, oh, here it is. Yeah, so what I have is I have all the videos here. I have a study, a, a, an ulti, another ultimate guide, and then I have the slides. So the slides that I worked off from today, I pulled from these slide decks that I've got here. I just condensed them and I pulled key slides out that I wanted to be able to talk about to kind of review with you. Um, and then I have the actual whole slide deck. But I'll give you access to this folder and uh, you can download it. But my certified in cybersecurity. So it's got the videos and the slides. That'll help you get, when you sign up and you go through the online training, that's what the, the videos you're going to see are these here, but these are just offline versions. So, but I can certainly do that for you. And I've got my cards up here. <laughs>